Thank you so much, Dennis. How's everybody doing today? That's fantastic. You know, uh, we start our, our team meetings with the Cowboys with that question every day. I walk in, and our team meetings usually start at 830. And sometimes I get kind of a tepid response from the guys, and I keep asking the question. So I was impressed by you guys, but I think we can even do better than we just did. So how are we doing today, boys? There we go. Fantastic. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you, Carol. Thanks to everybody here at Albertsons. It's exciting for me to be here with you today. I was driving over here. I typically don't come to the stadium uh, on, on a Tuesday morning. We, we, uh, we work out at the Star in Frisco. Uh, but I had the same feeling as I was driving over on 30 that I do every morning when I'm driving up the tollway. Um, what I think about is building a team we're all proud to be a part of forever. I think about that every day. I got about a 25, 30 minute drive and I'm driving up the tollway and that's what goes through my mind. How can we build a team that we're all proud to be a part of forever? That's really the goal. And uh, typically what I think about is all the great teams I've been on. And, I, and one day I counted them up and I've been on over 150 teams in my life. Starting with the, with the Monmouth Beach Falcons in Cap League when I was this high. And then it was the Monmouth Beach Tidal Waves and the Rumson Bulldogs and the St. Ann Sabres and all the way through. Football, basketball, baseball, ever since I was a little kid. Uh, now it's the Dallas Cowboys, truly a football team. And uh, what's interesting is I've been on a lot of really, really good teams. I've been part of three Super Bowl championship teams, a Super Bowl runner-up team, teams that won the NFC, teams that won state or CYO or the city championship. I've also been on some teams that weren't so good. And, and, and when I'm thinking about you know, doing everything I can to help us build a team we're all proud to be a part of, I think about these great teams and I think about these teams that fell short. And what I've, the conclusion that I've come to after all these years is it's not a real complicated formula. The best teams I've been on have three things. They have great leadership. They have a committed, motivated group of players, team members. And they have a thriving culture. It's as simple as that. Leadership. Okay, the guys who are in charge. Okay, it's strong leadership. And then it's the people who were involved, the players, the team members, the workforce. They're committed, they're motivated, they have each other's backs. And ultimately, there's a culture, there's an environment that you come into every day that's thriving, that's positive, that's upbeat, that brings the best out in people. That's what the best teams have. And the teams that aren't real good, they don't have that stuff. They don't have strong leadership. The guys, the players, the team members, they're not committed, they're not motivated, they don't have each other's backs. Okay, and the environment that you come into, you don't really like it. It's not bringing the best out in everybody. So I want to talk about those three things. It's real simple. Let's talk about leadership first. Um, if you go to a bookstore and you go to the section on leadership, there are thousands of books, right? If you Google leadership, it goes on and on and on and on, and everybody's writing a book on leadership, right? And there's a lot of things to talk about with leadership, about having a vision, communicating a vision, creating energy, setting standards, leading from different levels. There's all these different things that are so valid and so important and things I think about each and every day. But oftentimes that's putting the cart before the horse. I'm going to tell you a quick story. My first year with the Cowboys as a player was 1992. Uh, I came out of college in 1989. I was on a practice squad. I played in Canada. I came to the Cowboys. I'm trying to make the team as a fourth quarterback. And the story I'm going to tell you happened uh, it was late August. It was at the old Texas Stadium. It was the last preseason game. The Cowboys were playing the Chicago Bears. And if you guys follow football, the, the last preseason game is the one where Troy Aikman stands on the sidelines. He has no shoulder pads on, a baseball hat, and he's eating hot dogs. And Emmett Smith is right next to him, and Michael Irvin. These guys aren't playing. The best guys don't play. They have the night off. They're getting ready for the regular season. But guys like me, guys who are fledgling, hanging on by a string, trying to make a team, it's like the biggest night of our lives. So I was battling to be the third quarterback, and I was going to play the second half of the game. And if I played well and things went well, I had a good chance of making the team. And if I didn't, I probably would never play football again. 
So I told Aikman, just put the hot dog away for a little bit. This is an important night for me. I, I get a chance to go and play in the second half of the game, and uh, the first drive we get is on the minus two yard line. Minus two means the goal post is right here. We got 98 yards to go. It's not a good place to start. The guys in the huddle with me are guys just like me. We're all hanging on by a string. We need this, we need to play well, or else we're going home. With one exception, there was a guy named Kevin Gogan. Kevin Gogan happened to be my roommate. He, he was a starting guard for us, and for whatever reason, guys were hurt. He had to play with the rest of us. He's the biggest guy you've ever seen. If Gogan walked in that door, he's, I've never seen a bigger man than that. He's six feet eight, he's 350 pounds, he's got the biggest head you've ever seen. He's got this big laugh, he thinks he's the funniest guy, he's the only guy who laughs at his jokes. He's a real character. He gets the short straw, he's in the huddle with us. So, here we go. Big night, here we go, let's get this thing going. We run the ball, we throw the ball, we make a first down, make another first down, we're moving the ball. Before you know it, we've made four or five first downs, we're out by the 50 yard line. There's a timeout. I go over the sideline, I come back in, feeling good about how things are going, I get in the huddle. And I say, all right guys, what do you think? Uh, should we go on a hard count? Should we go on a quick count? I was asking these guys what cadence we should go on, what they would feel comfortable with. I felt like I was being a leader. Gogan, who's this mountain of a man, looks over at me during this time out and kind of looks down and says, hey, Red Ball, that was my nickname. Hey, Red Ball, you're the quarterback. You decide what snap count we're going on. It was a dagger right through my heart. Dagger. I am the quarterback. I decide what snap count we're going on. The first rule of leadership beyond all that other stuff that you always hear about that's so important is leaders need to accept the mantle of leadership. You're the quarterback. You're in charge of the huddle. You're in charge of the line of scrimmage. You're the guy when you step in there, there's 10 sets of eyes looking at you. When you're a leader, lead. That's line one. When you're a leader, lead. Don't manage, lead. Grasp the mantle of leadership. The head coach of that team at the time was Jimmy Johnson. I played for him for two years. There was not one minute of one day that me and everybody else in our organization, we didn't know who the leader was. Jimmy Johnson was the leader. He grasped the mantle of leadership of that football team. Troy Aikman, when he walked in the huddle, <laughs> damn, that's the leader of the football team. My first two years in coaching, I coached for Nick Saban. You guys know who Nick Saban is, the head coach at Alabama? He was the head coach of the Miami Dolphins. I was his quarterback coach. There was not one second of one day that we all didn't know who the leader was. Nick Saban was the leader. He was in the leadership role. He grasped the mental leadership. So when you talk about leadership, there's a lot of things that go into it, but line one is lead. Don't stand by the wayside. Don't manage. Don't, hey, da, 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 da. That's not how it works. When you're in a leadership role, lead. And when you're not in a leadership role, you can lead too. You can lead too. Maybe in some more subtle ways, but you can positively influence the group. That's what leadership is. That's the first thing of great teams. The second thing, committed, motivated workforce, team members, people who have each other's backs. Uh, about five years ago, uh, we took our team, we have a training camp out in Oxnard, California. Third week of July, we go out there, we spend about three weeks, it's a great environment. And typically we play the San Diego Chargers or the Rams or somebody out there in our preseason games early on. Uh, five years ago, at, on our way down to play the Chargers, we stopped in Coronado, California, where the Navy SEALs train. And we spent a day with those guys. And it was one of the, one of the great days I've ever been a part of. Uh, we had 90 guys on our football team, 25 plus coaches, another 30 or so staff members who were there. And uh, I don't know what you guys thought, but when I was thinking about going to see the Navy SEALs, I thought it was gonna be a, kind of this, this incredible um, state-of-the-art facility. It's really not. You kind of go down this road, you're kind of in this, Coronado is a beach town in, 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 that, down by San Diego, and you kind of pull in, it's a little bit rusted out, a little bit, the, old, the buildings are a little bit old, and we go into their hangar. Their hangar's like our team meeting room. And like I said, it was old. The tables were kind of old. They felt like they were like picnic tables or old cafeteria tables and chairs, and they were rusted out a little bit. It was kind of rugged and rustic. And we're all sitting in there. We all have our Dallas Cowboy warm-up suits on, and they were going to do a little presentation for our whole team. 
and then we're going to split up the players and the coaches and talk to us. And then we're going to have a couple of our strength coaches do the obstacle course. That was going to be our day. So we're waiting for the, for, for the presentation to start at 9 o'clock. I'm sitting down in the front row, way down on the right, kind of looking back at all our players. There's a little buzz, anticipation, waiting for the presentation to start. And, and all of a sudden, it gets really quiet. And on the back of the room, there's this guy. He's, he's in dress whites. And if you and I were making a movie and, and, and casting the guy who runs the Navy SEAL place in Coronado, California, we're, we're going to cast this guy. He's about 5'8", he's about 170 pounds. He's got the whitest, sharpest looking suit you've ever seen, his dress whites. Shiny white shoes, he's got a crease in the pants, crease on the sleeves, he's got more medals you've ever seen in your life. He's got the shiniest bald head you've ever seen. He's got this hat, and he comes walking down the back behind everybody and then comes straight down the aisle. And there was a little bit of a buzz. Everybody was kind of hee hee ha ha. And when they see this guy, everybody just gets completely quiet. And, and if our football team were in here right now, you would say, <clears throat> that's the biggest guy I've ever, I've never seen a bigger guy. That's the biggest, strongest looking guy I've ever seen in my life. I mean, our guys are impressive looking physically. If at that moment you said, okay, who do you take? You'd say, I'll, I'll take the bald headed guy, the 5'8 guy. I'll take him over anybody in the room. He was that kind of an intimidating figure. So he comes walking down the center aisle and all of our guys kind of stop and just looking at this guy. He flips around at the front, first thing out of his mouth, he says, take it easy boys, I didn't get dressed up for you, I have to go to a funeral afterwards. The guy's got to sit up in their chair and he talks to us, he talks about being a Navy SEAL and what that means and the standards they have and all of that and then we break up. Players go one way, coaches go another way. About a half an hour later, I'm with our coaches on the beach in Coronado, and we're watching a group of potential Navy SEALs go through their training. And it's really misty, it's cloudy, it's a little bit cold, and there's a group over here, and there's seven of them. And they have their, their fatigues on, they have boots, and these pants, and this the, this top, it's all long sleeve, it's all wet and sandy, they got their hats on, and they're dealing with this rubber boat. There's seven of these guys. And they're holding this boat above their head. And they do this for a little bit, and we're kind of watching them go through their drills, and, 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 and then they kind of get down to their knees, and then they sit down, they're holding the boat, they're holding the boat, they're holding the boat, they're getting tired, they put the boat down. They go see a guy, these master sergeant guys, that are right at the shore. And then they see, see swim out. There's a buoy about 100 yards out. So they dive in with their boots and their, and their fatigues on, and they swim out, and they come around the deal. They get here. They roll around in the sand. They run down the beach for about a quarter mile. They come back. They roll around again. They swim out. They come back. They roll around. Next thing you know, they're right there. They're holding the boat over their head. They do this again and again and again. We're just watching them. Over here, there's seven more guys. And they're doing the same thing, but they're doing with a log. It looks like a telephone pole. And again, holding it over their head. Okay, they get down on their knees, they sit down, they put it right here and they start doing crunches together. They get up, hold it up, sit down, kneel, go down here, swim out, come down, run down, roll around, swim out, come back, and they're standing right next to us. And we're just standing there watching this. And it goes on and on and on, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour. And all I can think about as I'm watching these guys is, they told us in the beginning, there's 150, 200 of these guys that show up. They want to be Navy SEALs. And they're going to keep 15, 18, 20 of them. Every one of them looks exactly the same to me. They're all 5'8", 5'9", 5'10", 170, 175 pounds. They all run the same. They all swim the same. They look exactly alike. And I'm thinking to myself, we've got 90 guys on our team right now, and we've got to get to 53. But every day, our stuff reveals itself. There's one guy that scores a touchdown every day. Another guy makes every tackle. This guy makes interceptions. This guy's just flat out faster than that guy. He throws it better than that guy. We're going to have some hard calls right at the end of it. But, but for the most part, they distinguish themselves over the course of training camp. And all I'm thinking about with these guys is they look exactly like. How do they go from 150 or 200 down to 15? How do they pick? And sure enough, I'm kind of standing on the end, and the guy 
the guy, the, the guy in the white suit, the guy who runs the place, is standing next to me. And I'm intimidated by this guy. <laughs> He's been standing there for 10 minutes. I'm afraid to say anything to him. And finally, I look at him. I just can't hold myself anymore. I look at him and say, how do you pick? He says, what do you mean? I said, how do you decide? I mean, there's 200 of these guys, and you're going to pick 15? They all look exactly alike to me. Our stuff reveals itself every day. How do you decide who stays and who goes? And he looks at me and says, we keep the ones who keep their arms straight. I said, huh? We keep the ones who keep their arms straight. I said, I'm sorry. I'm again, I'm a little bit intimidated. I'm kind of repeating myself. I said, I don't follow. What does that mean? He says, do you really think we use the rubber boats? Do you really think we use this, this log? What do you think this is all about? These guys go again and again and again doing the same things. They're here, and then they're here, and then they're here. Look at these guys. Their arms are shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking and shaking. And we do it again and again and again and again. And ultimately, we decide when we watch these guys that the ones who are able to, as, as, as exhausted as they are, as physically beaten as they are, the guys who when their arms are shaking, they just refuse to give in. They just fight and they fight and they fight and they fight and they fight. They won't stop. We keep those guys. He says, what we found is the guys who refuse to give in, the guys who keep their arms straight, they're going to be the same ones when the conditions get tough and we're out in the real world fighting the enemy, trying to accomplish a mission. Somehow, some way, they're going to fight to do their job. Somehow, some way, the guys who keep their arms straight are going to find a way to help us accomplish that mission. Most importantly, they're going to have that guy next to him. We're going to have that guy's back. And he walks away. We keep the ones who keep their arms straight. So when we're building our team with the Cowboys, I think about this constantly. There's going to be a guy who's bigger, faster, stronger, right? But ultimately, we want to build a team, committed, motivated workforce, team members who have each other's backs. We're going to keep the ones who keep their arms straight, the guys who aren't going to give in, because it's going to get tough, right? We're going to go up to New York. We're going to go up to Philadelphia. There's going to be a driving rainstorm. We're going to be down by a touchdown. We're going to have the guys who do this. We want the guys who fight and fight and fight. I'm going to get my job done. I'm going to find a way to help us win this game. I'm going to have this guy's back. Those are the guys you want on your team. Whatever team you're building. Whatever team you're building. Okay, the last part of this. It's leadership, committed, motivated team members, guys who have each other's backs. Those are great components. But you've got to somehow, some way, come up with a culture, an environment that you come to each and every day. Uh, a couple months ago, my dad passed away. He was 87 years old. Um, he and my mom were married for 59 years. He had eight kids, 29 grandkids, one great-grandchild. Uh, for over 60 years, he was in football, player, coach, scout. Um, we had the, the viewing the day before the funeral. And they told us before they're going to have this thing from 3 o'clock until 8 o'clock, five hours. And I'm kind of in this meeting as we're planning. I'm like, five hours for a viewing? That seems like a long time to me. So again, I have seven brothers and sisters. I'm just one of eight voices in this whole thing. And I said, all right, that's fine. OK, you guys know more about it than I do. But I'm a little bit skeptical. He's 87. A lot of his friends are not here anymore. So who's, who's coming to this thing? We had it up in New Jersey. And so we all went over to the funeral home. And the doors opened at 3 o'clock. Uh, my mom stood by the casket. My brothers and sisters and our spouses and all the grandkids were all around here. And uh, I looked at my watch at quarter to 8 for the first time. The long line that just kept coming and coming and coming and coming. And uh, I heard uh, we came to pay our respects, pay our respects 500 times that day. And I got to thinking about this word respect. My dad's favorite uh, baseball player, he, he loved football, but he really, really loved baseball. And uh, from New Jersey, lived up there. Uh, ever since he was a little kid, his favorite team was the Yankees. And his favorite player was Derek Jeter. And when Jeter retired, you guys know who Derek Jeter is? Uh, one of the great players ever. He's going to be a Hall of Famer. He played 20 years for the Yankees. 
uh, won five World Series, uh, was an all-star virtually every year of his career, had 3,000 hits. Uh, when Jeter retires, Nike does this commercial for him. I don't know if you guys remember, it was about a minute and a half. Uh, There's a guy named Bob Shepard, who was the announcer at Yankee Stadium, a very distinct voice, and shows Jeter coming out of the dugout. And says, now hitting for the Yankees, number two, Derek Jeter. Here comes Jeter, walking up to the plate. And they show him digging in. And they have kind of a close-up of his face. And the guy pitches, this guy named John Lester, who pitches for the Red Sox. And they show Lester kind of peering over his glove, and he goes like this. He tips his cap to Jeter. Sorry. <clears throat> and then uh, subsequent to that, they show pictures of firemen and policemen and teammates and opponents. And for a minute and a half, they show all these different people tipping their cap to Jeter, showing him respect. And it just struck me that word, the importance of that word at the end of your life or at the end of your career, what that means. It really means everything. And when I think about it, the word respect is a noun. Pay your respects. Show your respect for someone, for a job well done. But more importantly, the word respect is a verb. It's a verb. To act in a way that demonstrates high regard, to value, to care for, to appreciate. That's what respect is, it's a verb. You live a life of 87 years demonstrating respect, value and high regard for yourself, for people around you, for the opportunity that you have, for the privilege to do what you do, for the challenges of life, for the opponent, people will pay respects to you. If you do that for 20 years of your career and many years before that, they'll tip their cap to you at the end. They'll show you respect. But in order to get respect, you need to demonstrate respect. So as I think about this for a culture, that's what it is. If you want a thriving team culture, whatever your team is, it's about that word. The verb respect, to act in a way that demonstrates high regard, to value, to care for, to appreciate. You want a thriving team culture? Put that in the forefront of your culture. So what do the best teams have? They have great leadership, strong leadership leaders who embrace the mantle of leadership. They have a committed, motivated workforce, team members who have each other's backs, who will keep their arms straight during tough times. But then they have a culture and an environment of respect where people have a high regard for themselves and how they act and high regard for the people they work with. And they act that way. They demonstrate that way each and every day in all of their interactions. So as I drive up the tollway every morning, this is what I think about. Make sure I lead, don't just manage. Make sure we empower leadership on our coaching staff, on our football team, and get them to lead. Make sure we're picking the right guys, committed guys, motivated guys, guys who have each other's backs, and make sure that we respect ourselves, each other, and the opportunity that we have each and every day to be our best. That's all I got for you. Thanks so much, guys.